we are very delighted and absolutely fascinated uh, to have with us Peter Fikowski, the founder and chairman emeritus of the Foundation for Climate Restoration. Peter, you have a unique perspective uh, on what all the governments, businesses, NGOs and others are doing here in Glasgow at the UN Climate Conference. Uh, and from reading part of your new uh, draft book that you're soon to publish, you share the almost universal concern that humanity is not doing enough to combat and deal with climate change. But you go further. If I understand correctly, your perspective is that even if everybody follows the climate agreement, the Paris Climate Agreement to the letter, with energy, with vigor, with vision, with commitment and stepped up ambition, it's still not enough to ensure safe living conditions for the planet and it's now over seven billion people. Indeed, you describe the Paris Agreement as a Paris suicide pact, which is certainly tough talking uh, and, and quite a headline grabber. Uh, I think it's true to say at the core of your deep unease is that the much vaunted net zero target of 2050 and of course the halving of emissions by 2030 uh, which many countries have agreed to now in companies and cities, is not really a safety limit at all. Uh, humanity must and should take a further big step, uh, which you term climate restoration. Peter, we're going to turn to this momentarily soon, but first describe to us who you are uh, and how you came onto this unique journey and perspective. Yeah, thank you, Nick. It's, it's a real pr <clears throat> privilege to be here. And uh, I'm a physicist by training. Uh, I've only been involved in, in climate for about eight years. And, and uh, my background is in, in astrophysics and semiconductor manufacturing. And uh, for 30 years, I was doing advocacy as a volunteer for poverty work. Mm -hmm. And I came, in, came into this um, around 2010, and I could see that poverty was actually, and the hunger was getting, beginning to get worse, that we we're making huge progress in the 80s and the 90s, mm -hmm. and even around 2000, and things plateaued, and it was the climate, it was very clear. And I was amazed, when I was at MIT as an undergraduate in studying physics, I was read about global warming, and they told us, well, it was just very clear, we're, we were pouring all the CO2 in the air, and we would have to take it out, just like any pollution. Yeah. And I, I thought I considered worrying about it, but I said, you know, we have submarines, we have spacecraft, we have the technology technology to get CO2 out. And I didn't want to get in the way. I actually stayed in a astrophysics because I, I didn't want to be in the way of the really smart people, the adults in the room, who were going to get a trillion tons of CO2 out. Right. And then you fast forward from 75 to 2010, and I have my software business, I have 27 patents and image analysis and software, and I think, thinking, good, let me see what the climate community is doing. Yeah. And they hadn't taken on, taken on getting, doing what I thought was the obvious, and I think our audience will agree is the ob obvious, you have to get the pollution back out of the air. And they said, well, we have to adapt to it, we have to waffle, and, um, and that was the origin of climate restoration. I, was, uh, I w had been coaching the ci a group called Citizens Climate Lobby, and they were making progress, and then, but not much progress. And I finally said, great, what is your goal? What, what's the end result? And the, ED, the executive director said, hmm, Peter, that's your job now. <laughs> and that is the last job I wanted, right? right. I'm a, a, uh, reformed astrophysicist, artificial intelligence scientist, figuring out what the climate goal was. Anyway, so but I took it on uh, with a lot of consternation and realized that um, created climate restoration from that because I realized the only reason we worry about the climate is because we're humanity mm -hmm. and we want our grandchildren to live as well as we we're did. We're conscious. Right? We're conscious beings that are aware of something, yeah. yeah. Well, you're just coming to this moment now where you're ta starting to talk about climate restoration. And I think this is a good segue into this question, really, which is, um, I think that, you know, there are some people, perhaps many, I don't know how many, uh, that have heard that we need to draw down, uh, we need to lock away carbon that's currently in the atmosphere. 
uh, and some may have even heard of terms like geoengineering. Um, so tell us, what is climate restoration and perhaps what it isn't? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, climate restoration is a goal. And so um, I assume the graph is on. Yeah, it's just over oh, here. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And so. The blip. The, the blip, blip, it says. Yeah. Yes. So it's not one of those airships, is it? Uh, <laughs> that, that's a blip. That, this is yeah. a blip. Okay. And, and what's interesting is if you look at that over the last 10,000 years when we've developed agriculture and our whole civilization, it's been stable, both our CO2 and population, just gradually increasing, tiny bit every thousand years. And then there's the blip. Mm -hmm. And uh, I could show the graph of population and CO2. And obviously, if you have twice as many people, you have twice as much CO2. I uh -huh. don't have to explain that to anybody. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and so what happened is at the Industrial Revolution, we figured out how to, uh, to not have people not die. And it turns out that the feedback loop that keeps all of this stable and is, is the that keeps any species stable with its environment mm -hmm. is what I, in, for humanity, we call the child mortality rate. So if you're a salmon or you're an oak tree, you have lots of acorns and lots of, uh, what do you call, small salmon, fry. Yeah, fry, um, yeah. You know, we have millions, and on average, you know, two survive per female, on average over the period of time, and most of them die because, and not because of any, any deficiency, but in certain times and certain places, the environment can handle it not. So it just produces lots. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, in our great wisdom, we said, I hate my children dying, and I now, with technology, can do something about it. And so we broke the feedback loop so all children survive. It used to be one out of four, one out of three. And now it's 99% survive. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the blip. But now we also know, that, you know that what's cool here is the right-hand side is, oh, we can re re recover from the blip and come back to, to that goal of restoration. Right. So restoration is a goal. And there are methods that show us it's possible. I'm not committed that these are the methods. But anytime, anytime I plan a trip somewhere, like if I want to go from here to London, I want to make, you know, my mind says, are you sure you can do it? Of course, I can take a train or a mm. dr drive or something. Yeah. And so and I'm gonna, we're going to talk a little bit in a, a few minutes about yeah. the vehicles. Yes. But we have the vehicles. We just need to set the GPS back to sustainability, back to, to yeah. Let me ask you just something quickly on this idea of, of the plan, because, um, I mean, the governments in, in the rooms around the corner, uh, or wherever they are, yes. um, and others, think they have a plan, right? They have the Paris Climate Change Agreement. Yes. And they have a plan which is halve the emissions by 2030, net zero by 2050. This is the way to stay at a temperature rise of no more than 1.5 degrees centigrade on average. But th you, the plan you think is a bit flawed. Uh, Very yeah. much, yeah. yeah. As, as you said, I uh, call it with trepidation the Paris Suicide Pact. Yeah. Because if you look at the blip, the, um, the Paris goal state goes off the chart both for for. CO2 and population and stays there. Right. Now, there's no sign that humanity can survive that. And if you listen to the, if you read the IPCC and listen to every single speech here, no one is claiming that we can survive the Paris goal. <laughs> right. And so, now everyone, I've talked to a lot of people, thousands of people, and every single one said, of course we want sustainability. Yeah. It, and so the climate restoration is just saying aloud what we're all thinking. Yeah. Good. So from reading again the draft of your, your new book, which is, is coming out uh, hopefully soon, um, you have been looking at ways in which the planet itself has, through chemistry and other processes, at certain moments, in a sense naturally, in inverted commas, uh, taken methane and, and carbon ga gases out of the the atmosphere, um, and what you're thinking about is how can we actually mirror those processes, yes. but in a kind of catalytic way uh, and in a, in a kind of accelerated way, so it happens quickly rather than over a longer period of time. Just give us some examples of, I know there are four big ideas or whatever, yes. maybe give us one, maybe give us two, uh, in brief, how, yes. how would this look? Yeah, uh, the, the first one is for CO2. Um, 
I think most of us know that over the last million years, we've had 10 ice ages. And for the planet to go into an ice age, the nature removes a trillion tons of CO2. And that's the same amount of CO2 that we put into the atmosphere and we're going to take out again. Mm -hmm. Now, some people would say we should take out, but you and me, we're going to make sure this thing happens. So okay. we are going to take it out. All right. And, um, and what's interesting, if you look at that graph, and I sometimes show it, it goes up and down, and you ask, well, wait a minute, where does nature put that CO2? And it's in the ocean. Right. It, it's not in the trees, because trees don't last that long. It's not in the rock, because if, if you put it into rock, it doesn't come back out. And that, it goes into the ocean as just dissolved biomass. And so you have photosynthesis at the surface, with, and that's algae. Uh, or phytoplankton, if you like Latin, um, and um, and then it just uh, after you know a lot of the algae gets eaten by fish and all that stuff, but all the detritus sinks towards the middle of the ocean. Right at the end of the ice age, the currents change, the, the ocean currents change, and it oxidizes and it comes back out as CO two, and then the CO two comes back in the atmosphere. Right. Uh, it's really efficient. The ocean is 80% of our planet, and there's lots of sun, lots of water. There's actually a lot of nutrients, and the, the one nutrient that's critical and missing is iron. And what nature does is iron dust from uh, volcanoes and dust storms. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so uh, the catalytic way to do it is to figure out where to do it that has the most impact and is also financially viable. Because if, if you may have a good solution, but if you can't pay for it, I'm sorry, it's just not going to happen. It doesn't matter what your morals are and what your political <laughs> stand is. If you gotta, you've got to have a financial solution. Okay, so it's basically enriching the oceans with iron yes. in a deliberate way rather than in, in nature's... Well, it's like nature, but you're doing it faster, basically. Yeah, well, and it's yeah. Cr critically, it's only in the eddies. Yeah. And so uh, you need... Uh, each The eddies are about uh, 100 kilometers in diameter. And we need 500 of them to do the whole job by 2050. Okay. So it's not just some mass iron filings across all the world's oceans and seas. It's That's a, right. It, it's much more surgical than that, in a sense. Uh, yeah. Rather, and, and, okay. and never say iron filings, because they just fall. It's yeah. just dust. I, it's just I dust. keep thinking of things in staplers that come yes, out when you're trying to put paper, uh, paper together. <laughs> I, I don't know. know who made that up, iron filings, I but I, 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 I want to delete it. People working, filing bits of iron <laughs> to put in the ocean. It's <laughs> right, quite no, a hard job, dust. that one. It's just Could be a green job, though. So, yeah. 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 yeah, think of the Sahara Desert it's red, it's pink, yep. that's iron. Yeah. What okay. makes it red is iron. Okay. Any other, any other you yeah. want to mention? Yeah, the, the other one is methane. Yeah. Um, it, it, once I realized that we could get all the, all the CO2 out, for almost for sure, I thought, oh good, I can sleep. And then uh, two years ago, there was this big methane burst from the Arctic. And I thought, oh, that's right. I had put that out of my mind because there was nothing we could do. So I put it out of my mind. Mm. I said, okay, good that's now top of the list. It turns out that the way to get rid of that possible methane burst, and just methane in general, is what nature does. And nature oxidizes methane. It has a half-life of eight years in our atmosphere, and we're gonna reduce that to, by, to four years by amplifying the methods that nature uses to oxidize it. Right, and, and what does nature do, Peter? What does nature do with methane? Uh, there are two chemicals that are show up in the air that oxidize it. One is OH radicals or hydroxyl. I, yeah. I apologize for the Latin again. Nope. <laughs> and the, the other is... Uh, they, they all look like Latin scholars, don't uh, they? They, they do. Them. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> and the other is chlorine. And oh, oh, the OH does most of it, and the chlorine does a few percent. But we can amplify the chlorine. And okay. so we, we, it, it, we use iron again. Um, the iron attaches to three chlorines, so it's an iron chloride uh, dust or aer aerosol, and uh, we'll be putting probably putting it up in ship exhaust. Um, just you know, it's already there. Just we'll put it up in larger amounts, right. and that keeps the chlorine present, and it will. Uh, I could say more, but I won't no. uh, oxidize the methane. Yeah. And what's amazing is we can get methane back to pre-industrial before, well before the end of this decade. Wow, so it's really fast. It's really fast, and okay. that will set the stage for the rest of restoration. Okay. And one thing I read in the draft of the book is what you pointed out before. We're not talking trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars here. We're talking yes. in the billions, yeah? Yes. 
Yes. So it's, it's very doable economically. It, it is very doable. The, what's, um, it's just amazing. It, it, you know, it's like going to London. Well, if you say, I need to get to London, if you need to go fast, you find a flight. If you need to go cheap, you put out your thumb. Yep. You just do, you, when you know where you want to go, you find your way. Yep. Once we know we want to restore the climate, the, that, me, that methane solution, that's the most expensive solution of all the four. Yep. Um, and it's a, a, all of a billion dollars a year. And that's right. the cost of the iron fluoride. Okay. The the ocean, uh, pa the ocean pasture or ocean eddies, that one is self. It pays for itself because you grow fish. Uh huh. And in one of those eddies, it costs a million, maybe two million dollars to to add the iron dust. So it's not a big deal. Yeah. Produced last time they did it, it co produced five hundred million dollars of revenue for the state of Alaska. Good. Okay, let's move on. By the way, you shouldn't keep mentioning London. We're in Scotland. You have to mention Edinburgh. Edin oh They're God. very proud of the Scots. So yes. uh, I think we should, we should focus on oh, a, a ride to Edinburgh instead. Yes, okay. Okay. <laughs> so, Peter, I, I, you know, I was a journalist in the 1990s with the Times newspaper in London, and I was covering environment and technology, and you would get all these new ideas coming through. Yes. I mean, in those days, in the 1990s, a unit of uh, renewable energy was like something like $50 a unit. And every, a lot of people laughed at renewable energy then. Yes. Right? And, and now, of course, it's cheaper than coal in many places, which is, is yes. a, a great achievement. Um, and I suppose, I mean, you've got, a, you've got a new idea, you might say, or certainly a new idea to many, many, many people. I suppose... It, the question that other people would have if they were in the room was, it, it's cost effective, it's mimicking what nature has done for millennia, uh, and you're just fast forwarding it to deal with a major crisis and a major emergency. For the why, Yeah, for, why are the other scientists, uh, why are not governments, uh, why are not people all rising up and saying, we've got the answer, let's do it? Where, where is the break on this at the moment? Oh, that's great. <clears throat> the. the it's, it's, it's a big issue. Yeah. And it's a very simple answer, is that we've never had to deal with this. We've had 10,000 years of stability, and all we've had to do when things would go out of whack in our locality is say, stop doing that. Yeah. Or move on, or leave, and go, go somewhere leave. else. Yeah. yeah. Which you can't do now. Which you can't do now. No. And so the, our humanity, our species, is in a new stage. It's almost a new species. Rather than being tribal and worrying about our nation and so on, mm -hmm. we're one species, and we, have, we need to adjust our thinking. And uh, this, the, the thinking of the blip, it's, it's a global thing. And that's the reason we haven't thought about it, is we've never had to think globally before. Right, right. But you know, it's, not like, it's not a new idea, right? We, we, I, I can promise you, everyone who's listening to this has been thinking, of course we want to have a, sus a sustainable planet for my kids. Yes. That's not new. So is, is there a conspiracy of silence around it? Because people are nervous, uh, unlike you, and much yeah. more confident, you're prepared to come out oh, and actually talk question. about it. Um, do you think that it, it just takes a bit of a domino? There's you, yeah. and then you get another, well, and another, and another, then eventually people say, hold on a second here. Because I, I suppose at the back of my mind is, is that, there may come at some moment where things are so bad, where the gas is bubbling so badly out of the, uh, the, the Arctic regions and, the, and this sort of thing, that we have no alternative but to have incubated these ideas to be able to move down quickly. Yes, yeah. Um, you know, the, 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 the throttle point, the, the, the limiting factor, again, it's, it's uh, inertia. Yeah. And the scientific community loves the idea in private. So I did a, a, a workshop at MIT, my alma mater. Everyone loved it, the professors and the grad students and undergraduates and the clergy. Everyone loved it in, under Chatham House rules, but, you know, privacy. Yeah. Get out of the room, everyone says we have to reduce emissions. And as you can see, this is totally beyond reducing emissions. Yes. Yes. And I was really angry, and then I realized these, pe these professors have children in college. Uh, they, have to, they have careers in front of them, and they can't do, promote a tech an idea which has no funding. And that's the reason they, 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 when they say, I can't support you because it's too far outside my, my yeah. wheelhouse. Yeah. And so the action that needs to be taken is, if you're a funder, fund the science for restoring the climate. Have the researchers figure out how to do it faster than my idea. There's yeah. one person. Yeah. And if you're not a, a funder, tell your your uh, your leadership. 
you know, the, the media, especially your social media, that we are going to restore the climate and fund the research? Let's quickly then go to uh, where do we go from here? Where do we go from here, uh, Peter? I mean, what would be your message to governments in the corridors? Uh, what would be your message to NGOs? Anybody, really. Uh, what's the plan here? What are, you, yeah. what, are, what are you actually going to say to people when you meet them in the corridors or in the rooms? Yeah, uh, it, uh, it's, as I just said, it's a fund the research. Now, what's interesting is we have the I was going to say, yes. Peter, because you have this three-month plan, right? The success three months from now might look oh. like this. Oh, right. Yeah, success oh, might very, look like this. Good. Thank you for reminding me. Just, yeah, that, I think it would be good to outline that. Yeah. yeah. So, so, yeah, success three months from now would be some billionaires, and there are billionaires who are interested in this and family offices who are interested in this, but they don't want to stick their necks out just like most of our friends don't. And so we want to produce the, enough media that, yes, we are going to restore the climate. We are going to ride the, ride the blip um, and fasten your seatbelt. We're going to ride the blip. And it's OK for these funders to fund it. Yeah. What, uh, is, is there any Achilles heel in this story? I mean, I've never known anything that's perfect, right? Yes. I mean, even I'm not perfect, Peter, and it's hard to believe. <laughs> well, I know. Can you believe that? Don't worry. I've got lots of members of my family who attest to that's true. Okay. Um, but is there any is there any downside to, to what you envision? I mean, well, is there it, a risk? Well, uh, yes and no. That is, um, again, going to Edinburgh. You know, if you and I go to Edinburgh, we will get lost at one point, and then uh -huh. we'll find our way. And so everything that gets every solution that gets implemented, there will be screw-ups and they'll, you'll, we'll correct them right. and so uh, there will be short-term problems but what's nice is if you focus on just a solution like growing trees you can run into trouble because sometimes you have the wrong species and maybe you planted your whole continent with the wrong species of tree mm -hmm. that's a big problem because trees last a long time mm -hmm. now if you're focusing just on the goal of, of riding the blip to the other side now if you say oh I think those trees are the wrong trees you immediately correct and that's yep. why it's important to focus on the goal, not the solution. Right. Uh, colleagues, uh, technicians, people out there, how much longer do we have for our interview? Could you just advise me? One more minute. Right. Well, Peter, I think we've absolutely covered everything. The only thing we haven't covered is your new book. Uh, let me hand it to you yes. there, which is in draft at the moment. Yes. Uh, and yeah, just show it yeah. to the audience and yeah. to the viewers who are over there. So and when's yeah. that coming out? So uh, the the full book will come out in March of 2022. Um, climate restoration: the only future that will sustain humanity. Imagine that. And what's funny is it's such an audacious claim, and I've never found any way to say that it's not true. Yep. 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 Well, sometimes we need audacious claims to get yeah. people to sit up and pay attention. Right. And you, you can find you can download the the summary chapter, he, which we print, printed here on my website, peterfikowski.com. OK, super, Peter. Well, it's been a real pleasure to to meet you and, and to hear what you're doing. And uh, I wish you great success here at the COP in, in, in discussing this with as many people as possible. And <clears throat> let's see where it goes from here. Let's see where it goes. Ride exactly. the blip with me. Exactly. Ride the blip, yes. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much, Thank Peter. you. Okay. Thank you.
Good morning. It's very loud. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Sanjeev Kagram. I'm the CEO, Director General, and Dean of the Thunderbird School of Global Management. We're going to get started with our event called Scaling Carbon Removal to Meet the Paris Agreement and Beyond the Power of Global Partnerships and the Ocean. I want to pay a special thank you and gratitude to my co-host and partner, Brad Ack from Ocean Visions. Uh, we're going to focus first on a broad overview of a brand new global partnership on carbon removal that we're launching today. Then we'll have a deep dive into oceans as a critical mechanism and set of methods for carbon removal. And then we'll go back up to the larger uh, picture of the partnership and a series of activities and programs we are launching and continue to advance. A little bit about my background, why this is so important to me. Forgive the US accent, but I'm a refugee from Idi Amin's Uganda for a long time. I've been working in the field, launched uh, the World Commission on Dams back in the 1990s, all the way to the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data around the SDGs in 2015, 2015 the largest global partnership launched around uh, the UN goals. Um, all the time it's been about catalyzing scaled impact and innovative action in an inclusive, socially just, environmentally uh, just manner, uh, we know now that we have to have a third pillar uh, of climate transformation uh, alongside adaptation and mitigation. Today is, of course, the day for resilience, uh, and we believe that absolutely. We know that climate change is happening. We know that we have to decarbonize, but we absolutely need to have carbon removal at scale if we want to achieve the Paris Agreement and beyond. Not only to get to remove, go much lower than 420 parts per million where we are, let alone where we might end up, but to closer to 350 or less parts per million in the atmosphere in order to create a thriving planet, not just survival. Uh, so we believe that there is a mutually reinforcing positive virtuous cycle possible with decarbonization, which absolutely must happen, and carbon removal through both natural and technological solutions. As you see here, in order for us to do this, we have to be working together in Tamden uh, to get to net zero and beyond. And the key here is that we have to be more bold and ambitious, and these have to work together. Uh, we have a set of principles uh, for a carbon removal worldwide, and this is where I'm gonna stop before passing on to my wonderful colleague, Amanda, Ambassador Amba, uh, Amanda Ellis from the ASU uh, Global Futures Lab, who has been our partner in, in launching this initiative. As you can see, the principles are very clear. Durability, performance, social and environmental equity, absolutely central transparency and inclusivity. Now, we launched the Carbon Removal Task Force in Davos in January 2019. It was the, one of the largest events in Davos at the time. And of course, we were just entering the pandemic. Over the last 20 months, stakeholders from around the world, particularly from the Global South, have been working together to launch this global partnership. You're gonna hear from the governments of uh, Kenya and Colombia, but also stakeholders from other sectors that are all working together, the private sector, civil society, again, driven from the Global South. We see this as absolutely essential uh, over the next 10 to 15 to 20 years to really get us back into a direction that we really have to be. Welcome, <laughs> Madam Deputy President. Um, uh, let me pass it over to uh, Ambassador uh, Amanda Ellis to share a little bit about uh, Thunderbird School of Global Management was founded in 1946. We have 15 centers around the world, 50,000 alumni. Our commitment is to a world of sustainable, inclusive prosperity, launching the Global Carbon Removal Partnership with our great partners at Arizona State University the Global Futures Lab has been a critical part of our contribution. So let me pass it over to Ambassador Ellis. Thank you so much, Sanjeev. Enga mana, enga reo, enga rangatiratanga. Tena koto katoa. Greetings in Māori, the indigenous language of my home island, Aotearoa, New Zealand. This partnership is all about Sustainable Development Goal 17, and we are so lucky to have Sanjeev, who really is one of the global experts in creating and scaling partnerships to be leading this initiative with us. Indigenous wisdom is also an important element of the work. I 
am here to tell you how excited the ASU Julianne Wrigley Global Futures Laboratory is in supporting this partnership and to describe a couple of the practical initiatives that we have. First, a Center for Negative Carbon Emissions, which is led by Dr. Klaus Lochner, who many of you will know wrote the Nobel Prize winning IPCC paper, along with many others, back in 2007, and has really been at the forefront of direct air capture. We have a mechanical tree going up on campus soon, so we invite you all to come to the campus in Tempe and see that taking carbon out of the atmosphere. Second, we have a big project on certification. And as many of you will know, the carbon markets are really ramping up at the moment with the net zero targets, which is an exciting thing. And to make sure that the certification is valid, we have a program on that. And finally, a climate solutions center in Hawaii, which has just been stood up. Lots going on. You have a brilliant panel of people to hear from. And we are so thrilled to be part of this initiative. Thank you so much, Sanjeev. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Ellis. Uh, we are the joint secretariat of the Global Carbon Removal Partnership between the Thunderbird School and the Global Futures Lab at Arizona State University. A major leader in advancing this task force and now partnership has been the government of Kenya. I'm going to pass it over to my great friend and brother, Philip Tigo, who has been a senior advisor for the government of Kenya. We want to welcome her, <laughs> her Excellency, Madam Ruto. Thank you so much. All protocols observed. Thank you so much for your, all your support. And <laughs> Please, Philip. Uh, good morning, uh, and thank you so much for, for welcoming us into this panel. Uh, I think Ali. <laughs> uh, I'd cede my seat at the moment to the Senior Advisor for Climate, <laughs> Mr. Ali Mohammed. Uh, Ali. <laughs> Sorry, he has to settle. Uh, th th there's actually an African ministerial meeting, uh, so thank you so much, Ali, for stepping out of the meeting and joining us in this conversation. So as you know, the government of Kenya, uh, we call Kenya the climate capital of the world. Uh, we host, of course, the two UN headquarters in the Global South, the United Nations Environmental Programme and the United Nations Human, uh, Center for Human Settlements. Uh, so this resolution for us was a no-brainer. And so when we got uh, to collaborate with, of course, uh, Thunderbird School of G uh, Global Management, the city of LA, Colombia, uh, into looking at how carbon removal can be that, um, can bring the capability uh, combined with natural means uh, to, to sort of remove legacy carbon. So basically we have been sponsoring the resolution um, on carbon removal. This was tabled at the UN General Assembly this year in September. It's still at the second committee. Um, and beyond that, of course, we have a couple of uh, centers that we are putting together with the city of LA. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. And my apologies we just want to ask you to share with why the government of Kenya is such a leader on carbon removal efforts globally and advance this great UN resolution and will host COA headquarter the partnership. Ali, please, welcome. Well, well, so thank you, Sanjay, for once again, my apologies for coming late. And, well, uh, you know, the Kenya government really, uh, as my colleague was just saying, has been a big leader in matters of environmental conservation. And yes, uh, uh, UNEP, the, UNEP, the uh, UN, climate, uh, UN environment leader is uh, in, in Kenya. But from many years back, the government of Kenya has prioritized matters for environment as uh, important for the growth and development of the country. In the Horn of Africa, where Kenya is located, is one of the regions that is most affected by climate change. Currently, we are experiencing one of the worst droughts, a very prolonged drought because of uh, the lack of the seasonal rains. And this has been recurring on and off every other year. The frequency is becoming faster. I think uh, it's not a new thing to anybody who is here currently. And so the priority for the government of Kenya under the National Adaptation Plan that we have submitted, as well as our NDC that we submitted last year, December, prioritizes uh, response to climate change through uh, uh, nature-based solutions. And when we partnered with uh, Thunderbird School of uh, uh, Global Management, and, and thank you, Sanjeev, for that, uh, that was a great opportunity for us to continue partnering with uh, the big players uh, in the field of carbon removal, and ours is uh, removal through nature-based solutions. 
Uh, and we are able to do that. We have a big land mass, 590,000 um, square kilometers of land. Um, about 10% of that is protected areas, and these protected areas are massive. 10% of 590,000 can be used for you know, cultivation, for, for, for growth of plants rather, for reseeding of uh, uh, grasslands and, and so forth. And all this can contribute to reduction of uh, carbon. Um, of course, uh, we uh, here in uh, uh, Glasgow, the discussion of uh, carbon capture and uh, storage is, is, is a big issue. Uh, but but uh, we are not promoting that. We are promoting you know, usage of carbon, capturing of carbon through nature-based solutions and reuse of, of carbon. We, in the green zone, for those who have been able to, to, to go there, you will see uh, companies that are able to capture carbon uh, uh, and other pollutants and convert it into usable uh, things, uh, in fact, even food. And so that is the kind of solution that the Kenya government is promoting. And we have uh, already submitted this proposal to the UN General Assembly. We request other countries the whose delegation are in this uh, meeting room today to help us uh, promote that. Uh, and we'll continue to push it through UNFCCC as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Carol. Another government that's been incredibly important to the global carbon removal effort has been the government of Colombia. I want to welcome De Director Sire. Thank you so much for joining us. We know how busy uh, it has been for all governments, and certainly Colombia is such a leader on climate action and carbon removal in particular. Welcome, Alex. Yeah, thank you very much, Sanjeev. Um, um, so in Colombia, we have been working uh, using natural-based solutions uh, in order to uh, also do carbon removals and as a mitigation strategies. Uh, in fact, one of our main causes of greenhouse gas emissions is deforestation. So we are trying to uh, uh, apply some, uh, some, some measures to combat deforestation, but at the same time, working with our communities and working with the productive sectors in order to promote uh, natural-based solutions to do carbon removals in our country. And that's tied uh, with uh, also with our carbon markets. Colombia is a, a country that is really active on the carbon markets. We have a tax price, in fact, and uh, we have a no causation mechanism as well. So that has uh, increased a lot the number of transactions that, that we have been going doing in Colombia as well. Uh, I have some, some example of how are we using uh, uh, carbon removals or uh, natural-based solutions. For example, we have a, a, a goal of 180 million trees, which is, which is tied with uh, restoration plans. It's not only the trees, but it's a, a manner on how to uh, represent uh, 300,000 hectares that are being restored in Colombia. And one important thing about this, this program is that we are working with companies on their compensation plans. We are working with local governments and local authorities, environmental authorities, in order to put in place this plan. We already planted 90 million trees in Colombia, which are uh, which with a commitment of a three-year maintenance. Also, we have a program in Colombia uh, called One Million Corals. Um, and uh, it's another uh, program that we are developing with the communities in order to not only restore, but replenish some, some coral, coral reefs that we, we have in Colombia. And uh, also we are working right now in one of the first blue carbon projects in Colombia uh, that we recently launched uh, this year uh, in Bahia de Cispata. And we are working with uh, 18 different communities in, in order to maintain, uh, replenish, and restore uh, mangrove uh, areas uh, in our country. And another important natural-based solution, which is really focused on to carbon removal, is that we are working with the beef industry and the uh, and the industry like agricultural industry to do silvopasture, um, and we we have a, a, in our indices we have a silvopasture goal, and as well we develop a, 
Nama, eh, Nama Ganadería, as we call it. Eh, and in this Nama, we are working with, uh, with cattle ranchers in order to promote uh, silvopasture uh, in our country. And in that way, we want to reach uh, zero deforestation to 2030, which is one of our main goals in Colombia uh, in our indices on, on, on to, to, uh, 2030. So in this sense, we are working with uh, many actors and many, and many fronts to put in place uh, this kind of activities that will help us not, not only on the mediation uh, side, but also in the adaptation side, because these kind of solutions uh, uh, contributes to, to all this. And on the, on, as a uh, transversal way, we are working on a, a, a strengthening our carbon markets regulation. So right now, this year, we are going to issue a new regulation on OBBs, uh, organisms for validation and verification that will give uh, transparency and, uh, and will enhance our carbon, our carbon markets in Colombia. Thank you so much, Director Sire. So I think you hear from our uh, government leaders in Kenya and Colombia, the Global South is really leading the way and must lead the way in terms of global climate transformation and particularly carbon removal that decarbonization adaptation can be done hand in hand with carbon removal they don't have to be mutually exclusive there's a major focus on natural solutions absolutely essential and in our deep dive on oceans uh, with Ack and colleagues you'll see a major aspect of that but we also want to highlight the incredible new technological solutions, as was mentioned by Ambassador Ellis, direct air capture, negative carbon building materials, and many others. These all have to work in tandem together. Now I want to go over to Ambassador Cousins. Um, uh, cousin, sorry. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Ambassador. I'm going to have someone pass you. Oh, you have it? Great. I just want to say, as, as a part of an introduction, um, Mayor Garcetti of the city of LA has been an incredible champion of climate action, obviously, as the chair of the C40. Ambassador Hjigan, his deputy mayor of international affairs, has been an incredible partner for us. From the very beginning, the city of LA, with its transformative plans for climate and sustainability, has been a support to the Global Carbon Removal Task Force and now partnership. And so the partnership will be co headquarters, as I mentioned, in Nairobi and Los Angeles. Thanks so much for joining us, Ambassador. Over to you. Well, good morning. And uh, first, let me thank you, Dean Sanjeev. Uh, and the Thunderbird School, and of course you, uh, Ambassador Ellis, for your leadership in organizing this partnership in today's event. My name is Earthrin Cousin, and I'm the former U.S. Ambassador for Food and Agriculture and the former Executive Director of the World Food Program. And I know some people would say, what is Earthrin doing here talking about energy and carbon removal? Because the reality of it is, we don't have the choice of doing food and agriculture, transportation, and energy. We must do it all simultaneously in order to address the challenges of reducing greenhouse gas emissions and achieving the net zero goals that we all look forward to working together to achieve. I sit on the board of the Angelino Group, a pioneer in providing growth capital for next generation energy and climate solutions. The Angelino Group is based in Los Angeles, California and was founded in 2001 and it's one of the largest private equity firms dedicated to clean energy and sustainability investment in the United States, making growth investments for a global scale. Our strength is rooted in what is Los Angeles is doing to reduce emissions and transition to green and a just economy. The ambitious goals set by Mayor Eric Garcetti and LA's Green New Deal depend on collaboration between public, private, and nonprofit sectors. And they depend on a shared belief that together we can tackle the climate crisis. I want to highlight just a few of LA's climate milestones. A new roadmap to a zero carbon energy grid by 2035 and a 97% renewable energy by 2030. 
with data to support that this transition will be cost effective and reliable for LA residents. LA is the number one solar city in the country, six years running, based on photovoltaic panels installed and in use in the city, home to the largest feed-in tariff program in the United States. LA is showing its commitment to equitable electric vehicle charging infrastructure. LA is already home to the most electric vehicles and chargers of any city in the United States and has deployed subsidized EV chargers, car sharing in disadvantaged communities across the city and county. The ports of LA and Long Beach are the greenest ports in the US with shore side plug-in power for ships and zero emission port equipment and trucks that use electricity or hydrogen instead of fossil fuels. LA isn't just using clean tech innovations, it is also the place to create those innovations and to scale them. The Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator launched 10 years ago and their inclusive approach has resulted in a current cohort with 60% of its founders from groups traditionally underrepresented in the tech space. And from Ampere's electric airplanes and Exos electric class 5A trucks to one of the largest solar and storage plants owned by 8-Minute Energy LA companies are market leaders. And we see the potential for carbon removal, as you've spoken, including those who have already made California their home, like the Blue Planet Systems and Carbon Capture Inc. LA's global connectivity, our people, and our diversity, and our commitment to climate action make the city an ideal location for multi-sectoral, multi-stakeholder coalitions like this global carbon removal partnership. We know governments alone can't do this. We know private sector alone can't do this. We cannot win this fight unless we're all in this together that we have the multi-sectoral commitment, the financial investments, the political will to shape the world that we must leave for our children. I celebrate with our friends and partners from Thunderbird and welcome the Global and Carbon Removal Partnership to Los Angeles as well as to Nairobi. We are so excited to celebrate with you together. I look forward to visiting with you, Madam and your leadership team as we move forward to creating a sustainable future in our world. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Ambassador Keswick. <laughs> Let me go over to now my brother, uh, oh, sorry, going forward, uh, Kumi Naidu, uh, who will share a perspective from global civil society why this is such a critical uh, effort for us, global carbon removal. Kumi, my brother. Thank you, Sanjeev, and good morning, everyone. Just a few short years ago, uh, as the former Secretary General of Amnesty and the former head of Greenpeace International, we would have never touched carbon removal. The reason for that is it would have been a convenient excuse for a corrupt fossil fuel industry and other polluting industries to delay action. Thankfully, we have now finally, very late, won the argument that we have to decarbonize and we have to be very clear that the agenda of decarbonization has to continue as the IPCC has said, and that even if we did that, even if tomorrow we switched off all emissions, we still do not get out of the mess that we have created. That in fact, the math does not add up. And it is for that reason, carbon removal becomes a key part of climate action as a third pillar. Uh, in 2015, when I was in the Pacific, I heard people chanting the slogan, 1.5 to stay alive. Six months later, when I met the same delegation in Paris, they were chanting, 1.5, we must survive. The reality and the elephant in the room in this COP 
is that this COP, by the way, I've attended many, many. Mary Robinson just said, this is the most male, pale, and stale COP that we've had. This is the most white and elitist, northern-dominated COP that we've had. And we need to make sure that these principles, which are sound and uh, progressive, are genuinely, genuinely adhered to if we are to actually make sure that this moves forward in a positive way. Um, I want to draw attention especially to three, four, and five. I think social and environmental equity does not exist in the world, and we need to make sure that every initiative moving forward that there is um, adherence to it. Transparency, especially with regard to how this process rolls out right now and how we deepen consultations with indigenous peoples, with frontline communities, with those most affected, has to be critical if this is to win the legitimacy of a large number of people who have been in the front line of the climate struggle who will be hesitant about an initiative like this. So there is a lot of work that needs to be done. I just want to conclude with two um, sort of elephants in the room, in a way. One is this assumes that the economic system that we have stays exactly as it is while we try to do this. And just to be clear, for those of us who've been in the climate uh, struggle for a long time, recognize it is the economic system that has got us to this point. And there has to be a recognition that we have to push for transformation of our economic system as much as addressing this if we're going to get a success. Complicated as it is, it has to be put on the table. The second issue is who decides what is a legitimate intervention to make in terms of the carbon removal process. There will be people who can make money out of this process and institutions that can benefit economically. We have to ensure that the verification... Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Sorry, in the old days, if that happened to you when I was... Uh, activists in the anti apartheid struggle, you'd say that the intelligence agencies have just <laughs> intervened. <laughs> uh, so, so, so let me just say, I think there will be many ideas, and, and we hope that this initiative here will generate and create an enabling environment for much more innovation, creativity, new things that we don't even know about just yet, right? But who decides ultimately that that is a legitimate intervention going forward and I would say that we need to figure out how we engage with the IPCC so the IPCC actually has a voice in providing an independent verification of some of these initiatives. For example, the tree planting that my brother from Colombia has spoken about, we know that in the 2018 IPCC report there was a clear call for one trillion trees to be planted for example. So we need to make sure that because you, we can easily get exaggerated claims by certain industry players about how successful certain things are going to be without uh, necessarily it being verified independently. So with all of those things, I just end by saying that we are at a moment where those in power after the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009, had a chance to make big changes. But what they did was it, they responded with system recovery, system protection, and system maintenance. What we need now, and this initiative can contribute, is system innovation, system redesign, and system transformation. If we are not committed to do, do that, we will not ensure that the potential that lies with carbon removal is actually achieved. And let's hope that working together in a multi-sectoral way, uh, we can actually achieve that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Brother Kumi. We're going to now transition. I, would just, I hope you get a sense of the power behind the partnership, Global South, Global North, across the uh, stakeholders. We're going to go now deep into system innovation and transformation with Oceans, with Brad Ack and an incredible team of folks. So we're going to step down and let Brad take over. Welcome, my brother. Thank you. If Margaret and Kilaparti and Anna Marie can come forward, please. Well, that was an awesome uh, introduction to the global 
partnership for carbon removal. Clearly, we have a broad-based coalition of organization and entities that are interested in carbon removal. We know we have an enormous mountain to climb for carbon removal. We are literally talking in the, from the IPCC between 100 to 1,000 gigatons of carbon must be removed by through the course of this century to have a chance of reaching the 1.5 goal. If we want to do better than 1.5, we're going to have to take out more. So we are going to need many new solutions to this problem. The capacity to remove carbon at that scale does not exist right now. Biggest plant was announced uh, a month ago in Iceland, 4,000 tons, okay? Take that by 1,000, that's 4 million tons, and then another 1,000 would be 4 gigatons. We need between 100 and 1,000. So the question here on the floor today is can the oceans play a role in helping with some of this carbon removal? And here I have a great panel uh, with me to talk about that. And all of us are members of a consortium called Ocean Visions, which is essentially a partnership between some significant players in the marine uh, oceanographic sciences and academic space, coupled with private sector players, accelerators, investors, um, conservation organizations, and others. And our focus is really around the question of how do we bring new thinking and new technology and new solutions forward for some of these problems? And we're particularly focused on ocean-based carbon removal. Here to, what we're gonna do with you today in this brief time we have is I'm gonna turn to uh, Margaret Leinen, who's the director of the Scripps Institute of Oceanography, one of our esteemed partners, to talk a little bit about why climate action, why carbon removal is so important for ocean health, not just how oceans can contribute to climate health, but why we have to have carbon removal for ocean health. I'm gonna then go into a deeper dive of some of the pathways for ocean-based carbon removal, and then we will um, talk about some of the most critical challenges of governance and social and political acceptance, equity and justice, and other considerations of great importance. So. Without further ado, let me turn it to Margaret Leinen to give us an intro to oceans and uh, climate impacts. Great, thank you, Brad. So Brad asked me to remind you of what's happening in the ocean and why it's so important for us to concentrate on carbon removal. So most of you know that, that uh, the first and most direct uh, impact on the ocean is its uptake of CO2. It's currently taking up about one third of the CO2 that's generated by our emissions. And that has a direct effect on the ocean because the CO2 dissolves in the ocean. And as a result of that, it very slightly acidifies the ocean. And for years, we, we kind of ignored this because the impact uh, of acidification was so small. Starting in 2005, we realized that that was a huge oversight. We first demonstrated then that the, the foundation of ocean life, plankton, were being affected by CO2, and that it was making it more difficult for many plankton to make their skeletal elements uh, as a result of the acidification. Starting in about 2012, we found that it was affecting the viability of shellfish larvae, so it was now affecting food. And then even more recently, we have found that it is, a, it ha is having a great impact on the physiology of, of ocean organisms. So both in terms of the foundation of the ocean ecosystem and, and the, ec and the, the uh, physiology of the organisms in the ecosystem, CO2 uh, is, a, is a major impact. The second uh, impact is indirectly through the heating of the atmosphere. And over time, that heat in the atmosphere is being taken up by the ocean. In fact, the ocean has taken up more than 90% of the, 
of the heat generated from greenhouse gases. And we've, uh, as a result of the Argo program, we know that the entire upper 2,000 meters of the ocean has warmed significantly, and has warmed significantly even in the last 20 years. As a result of recent work uh, studying the deep ocean, we found that that heating continues down to the, the great depths of the ocean. Even at 6,000 meters depth in the ocean, we're seeing the impact of heating. So the ocean itself is heating. That makes the ocean expand, and that creates the indirect effect of sea level rise. 50% of sea level rise is a result of ocean heating. The rest is a result of melting of uh, land-based land glaciers and, and snow. But half is a direct result of ocean heat. The third uh, uh, indirect effect is deoxygenation of the ocean. And the warming of the ocean and it, its impact on what's called uh, the oxygen minimum, which occurs around 200 to 700 meters depth in the ocean, has been to amplify that oxygen minimum. And in places in the ocean, there's actually zero oxygen in that oxygen minimum. So it's created this huge niche of the ocean that has expanded the, to, uh, to impact ocean life. So all of these are f effects uh, for not only ecosystems, but also for hazards for humans through sea level rise. Now, today's the Resilience Day at, the, uh, at COP, and the oceans are very resilient. Uh, oceans have been here when there was no oxygen in the atmosphere. They've been here when we had great glaciers. They've been here during times of, of uh, great CO2 in the past. However, they were very different oceans. Uh, the life in them was very different, and the circulation of them was very different. Uh, so the resilience, the thing that we have to worry about is not so much the ocean, but us. Because our entire civilization is based on the ocean of pre-industrial CO2. And so the, the, uh, uh, the great uh, risk uh, is not to uh, oceans. They'll, they could change. They could be very different. But to us and our livelihoods. Uh, our food security, uh, hazards, uh, and all of these aspects. And uh, before we go on with the rest of the discussion of nature-based solutions in the ocean, I want to remind you that most of the carbon on the planet is in the ocean in the form of bicarbonate. So most of these techniques look to enhance that dissolved bicarbonate in the ocean, uh, which has plenty of uh, capability of taking it up. Thanks, Brett. Thank you, Margaret. That was a great overview of climate impacts to the ocean. So the question really is, not only can we use the ocean to remove carbon, but can we actually restore the ocean, protect the ocean, replenish the ocean by removing and safely storing carbon? Because without getting that carbon out of the atmosphere, the oceans are going to continue to change in a way that is going to be very difficult for humans on the planet, not to mention all the life in the ocean. So Ocean Visions has been working on a series of what we call roadmaps for um, ocean-based carbon dioxide removal. It starts from a premise that we have to have a new climate action plan for us and for the ocean. We have spent the last 40 years on number one here, which is decarbonization. Frankly, we have failed. We have failed, and we see people in the streets in Glasgow reminding us that we have all failed there. We need to double down and get much better at that, but it's too late to rely on that pillar alone. We have to take carbon out of the atmosphere now. Our international scientific bodies are clear about that. We also are gonna need to work on actually keeping ecosystems from tipping into different states, such as uh, Arctic and coral reefs and others. We're not gonna talk about that today. We're gonna to focus on negative emissions. I already mentioned the IPCC made it very clear all pathways that limit um, warming to 1.5 require massive, massive carbon removal. 
again, 100 to 1,000 gigatons. 1,000 gigatons is a trillion tons of carbon. And 1.5 isn't good enough, right? We know we need to go past that, and that means we're going to have to even take out more. So what role does the ocean have to play? Margaret already mentioned, the ocean already stores a significant amount of carbon, 50 times more carbon at the bottom of the ocean than in the atmosphere. So if you can manipulate that a little bit in a safe way, which we don't know yet for sure, but if we could, the ocean clearly has the capacity to store a lot of carbon. And what's interesting uh, is that there may be significant co-benefits for nature. For example, taking carbon out of the upper layer of the ocean reduces ocean acidification. So it also can help restore uh, habitat for, for fish and, um, and other marine life. Clearly, there's many less conflicts than on land. So we've convened experts uh, across the globe for uh, over a year to really look at what are some of these pathways and what are the needs in order to move them forward to a point where we could answer the question, can they contribute in a meaningful way to this problem? There's a number of ocean-based pathways. I'm gonna go into each of them uh, very briefly. Anything that photosynthesizes in the ocean potentially removes carbon. So could be microalgae, could be macroalgae, any ocean plant. Um, then there's more uh, sort of uh, processes that follow geologic approaches to carbon sequestration, which is interacting alkaline material with seawater. Uh, and then there's actually much more advanced technological approaches that are electrochemistry, essentially the direct air capture uh, in oceans. So. The first of these um, I'm gonna focus on would include microalgae as well, but I'm gonna just talk about macroalgae. It's basically large scale cultivation of kelp. So inshore, but also offshore, right? We have a lot of uh, aquacultured seaweed near shore, but if we're gonna to get to the scales necessary uh, for removal at the, at the levels we're talking about, it's gonna to have to move offshore. So it's gonna be a new set of engineering and technology challenges. But basically, once you grow the seaweed, you've got a variety of options for what you can do with it. You can truck it onto land and create um, products uh, that permanently or, or for a very long time store the carbon. You can actually put the biomass at the bottom of the ocean and store it that way. There's a lot of work that needs to be done about environmental effects uh, and about durability and additionality. But nevertheless, there's a whole range of opportunities around macroalgae. The second one is essentially accelerating the geologic processes in the ocean that already will recycle all this carbon that we've put in the air, but it will take millennia. This is uh, an attempt to speed it up by interacting what are abundant minerals on the planet with seawater uh, to essentially create more of those bicarbonates that Margaret was talking about through a fairly complex chemical process. But we know this works. This is, uh, this is not uh, speculative. We don't know if we can do it at the scales necessary, and we don't know what the impacts will be when we scale it, but we know that it's a pathway for carbon removal. The last one is electrochemical, which is basically just think of the direct air capture equivalent in the ocean. So you're using electricity and membranes to remove carbon out of seawater where it's much more abundant than it is in the atmosphere. So potentially, Electrochemical approaches could be very effective in the ocean because there's more carbon to capture than in the atmosphere. So all of these require a lot more work and that's what we did with these roadmaps. So this is, if you go to the website, oceanvisions.org forward slash roadmaps, you will see this, uh, this home screen. And for each of those three big domains, as we call them, of carbon removal, um, you will see, uh, you will see the state of the technology, which has an overview of the technologies in that domain, what some of the technology readiness level is, what the CDR potential is, and environmental co-benefits and environmental risks. There's also actually a social co-benefits and social risks that uh, is in the current version. You will then be able to also click on what are the gaps and needs. So what do we have to do to build out these areas? And that's including things like engineering, like science, monitoring and verification. And then last and most importantly, what are the first order priorities? And again, this was crowdsourced with a lot of 
uh, scientists and practitioners and government officials and others um, to try and determine what are the most critical next steps to answer the question, will ocean-based pathways be able to contribute to carbon removal at scale, and can they do that in a way that is less harmful than the illness that we're facing right now from an excess of carbon, right? It has to be less harmful than, than the path that we're on. So one of the maps is, um, there's the three technology maps, and then there's two maps on cross-cutting issues. One of those cross-cutting issues, which is absolutely the critical, is around social and political acceptance. These are novel concepts. There are very strong constituencies concerned about the oceans. I've worked in ocean conservation for 30 years, so I'm part of that. Um, but nevertheless, there's a whole series of issues that have to be addressed. Governance and social and environmental acceptance among the lead on that. And so I have two um, very esteemed panelists to now help me talk about these topics. First, I'm gonna turn it to uh, Kilaparti Ramakrishna, who has an illustrious career with the UN. He has advised um, uh, the director of UNEP. He has been a senior advisor to the head of the Green Climate Fund, and he's been part of the senior management of the UN for some time. He actually started his career at, at one of our partners, the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. He's now back at Woods Hole. Uh, to advise the director there, and I would invite you to talk about some of the challenges with governance and the opportunities, if you would. Good morning. Thank you very much, Brad. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and to speak to you about this. Uh, you know, those of you that are interested in oceans and their role in providing solutions to the climate crisis that we face probably know for a long period of time uh, that they are connected. In inextricably and importantly connected and we need to do something about it. But those of you that are in the negotiations um, probably don't realize that. You know, this is one of the biggest tragedies. You know, as Brad mentioned, I worked with the UN system. I was in the drafting of the Framework Convention on Climate Change. But until the Paris Agreement, there is no mention of the oceans in the agreements that we have. Um, and you know, you don't get that sense when you look at what is happening, you know, in the outside arena. Um, if you look at the IPCC special report on oceans and cryosphere, you know, it clearly talks about in the high emission scenario, 60% of the oceans is going to be impacted by uh, what, what we are doing to the climate change. In the low emission scenario, about 30% of the oceans is going to be connected. The question of the role that oceans play and particularly the carbon dioxide removal uh, is a no-brainer. You know, when you think about it, the international system, particularly the negotiations that are going on, don't really capture that connection. Uh, they did not do that with forests in the beginning. They did not do that with the adaptation in the beginning because they wanted it to be just emission reductions that they could measure and monitor and verify and so on and so forth. All good, but... The, given the crisis that we are facing, we cannot afford to miss out on any solution, and particularly the vital role, as you have heard from both ASU and Ocean Visions, um, and my colleague uh, from Scripps, is absolutely vital. And then, so we need to think about that you know, very carefully. Uh, the last point that I want to make is, one of the things that is being said about CDR is like it is just some crazy bunch of scientists talking about this. Um, it, it, it is not widely known, far from it. The National Academies of Sciences in the United States have con conducted reports, there's another that is going to be released this month, I, I believe. Um, and you know, th there is quite a lot of uh, studies that are there that tell us exactly what the implications are and it's time for the world community to pay attention to that. And clearly there is more work that needs to be done in terms of getting the message out to the negotiators. Um, and the very last point that I want to mention is that we need to think about the multilateral frameworks that exist, you know, whether it is the Law of the Sea Convention, London Dumping Convention, the Protocol, um, and the Biodiversity Convention, uh, and the negotiations that are currently underway, biodiversity beyond national jurisdictions. We need to bring all of them in sync with what the climate goals are seeking to achieve. And unless we do that, we are going to be missing out on not only the biggest opportunity, but as, as uh, Margaret talked about, um, you know, the damage that we would be doing 
to the oceans uh, and the impact that they would have on humanity would be irreparable and something that we cannot afford to take on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rama. So uh, you'll see at the bottom of this slide that one of the key obstacles is underdeveloped regulatory and governance structures. And we clearly need to insert this topic into international negotiations like the one we are at today. There is almost no discussion that I'm aware of at COP26 about ocean-based CDR other than this event. I hope there's others. Um, we welcome the government of Kenya's uh, contribution to the resolution for carbon removal. That is an important uh, step in moving this forward so that governments begin to talk about these pathways and create regulatory, enabling regulatory frameworks to, for the testing and development. There's also a whole series of environmental issues that have to be studied and have to be questions that have to be answered. Nobody wants to move forward to do anything that would be worse than what we face. Here to talk a little bit about some of the environmental concerns is our final panelist, Anna, Ma Anna Maria Laura, who is currently the head of climate policy for the Ocean Conservancy, but she also has served in that similar role at RARE, both of which are um, uh, U.S. Uh, conservation organizations, and she advised one of the most climate and ocean literate senators in the U.S. Senate, uh, Sheldon Whitehouse. So, Anna Marie, please take away. Thanks, Brad, and thanks for having us here. Um, I think this conversation is really important to remember the context of how the ocean protection movement began, which was to counteract this idea that the ocean could handle whatever we took in and that we could take whatever we want out, it, out of it. And that just ended up not being true. There were consequences to our activities. So then we started managing these resources and permitting and restricting who could take what and when. And that also led to sort of a privatization of a lot of the resources, where the benefits of access and utilization accrued to only a few. Um, and so it's really within that context that we find the ocean community and a lot of the environmental community um, preaching a precautionary approach when we talk about some of these solutions, including CDR. And there are really good reasons for that, and we have learned a lot, but that, that is part of where it's coming from for good reason. Then the other reason that, you, um, that we do need to proceed with caution is that, as Brad has already mentioned, we're not sure about the mitigation benefits. So when you're, the solutions that um, are being put forward, the scale that they may need to be implemented is really a system scale or an ecosystem scale. And when we're not sure about mitigation benefits, then it is with caution that we need to proceed because we cannot afford to get this wrong. When we talk about the climate solutions that are on the table, we don't have a lot of time. We need to act quickly. And so we want to invest and double down on the solutions that actually achieve the mitigation potential, the mitigation reductions that we know we need. And so that means we need more science and research, and we need it very quickly to understand the mitigation potential, to understand the environmental consequences and risks in a, in a more robust way than we currently do. Um, and if we can get that science and research going now, then potentially when all of the good commitments that are being made here and throughout the end of the week, we hope, um, start to be achieved, we will also be ready to come in with some science-based and uh, environmentally just and socially just solutions. And then just the third thing is that the fact that there are these net zero commitments, and we've heard a lot this week, means that an emerging carbon market is coming, and that can be a really good thing to catalyze the science and research that we need. We also just need to remember that markets attract interests that may not be aligned as much with our climate goals as they are with their profits. And we've also seen that in the past, and so that's another reason that we need to um, really think carefully about who the benefits of a new market accrue to, who gets to participate in that market, and who makes the decisions. And that one of the solutions, if we're going to go forward, is making sure we view this sector in particular through a justice lens, um, starting with the science, who does the science and where is it happening, all the way through the decisions about pilot projects and scaling up, um, all the way through the end. And so it's, it's really, this needs to be a justice lens. We need the science if we're going to move forward. Um, and we need to make sure that we think carefully about who the benefits of a new market will accrue to. Thank you so much. That was an excellent, quick overview of some of the most critical challenges that we have to deal with here. These roadmaps uh, lay out all of these opportunities. They are actually like wiki sites. You can sign up to be a contributor. You can actually put projects up. They're designed to be the place where we work together to move ocean-based carbon removal forward in a way that is equitable, that is transparent, that is science-based, and where we make the right moves at the right time. So 
Thank you all, and you know we're so excited to be part of the global partnership for carbon removal. Ocean Visions is one of the founding members. We look forward to working with the governments involved uh, and all of the other players in collectively moving this field forward. So hopefully at COP27, we'll have a whole day on carbon removal, and we'll actually start to talk about real commitments of real resources, human and financial, to move this. I want to now turn it back to my dear colleague Sanjeev, who's got a couple of final announcements before we close out the session. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you so much, Brad. We're going to have to, if I may, ask the panelists to switch. <laughs> We're doing our little tango here, a little dance. I want to just thank Brad for his incredible leadership, our incredible plan panel. I'm going to ask our delegation from Kenya, the principal secretary, Madam Ruto, please, if you could join us at the front, Ali. Uh, I just want to remind you again that for us, um, we are launching here very quickly. Uh, oh, this is probably too much. <laughs> I'm going to go back here. Uh, the Global Carbon Removal Partnership. We're so pleased, Ambassador Ellis. Uh, and we have been working for 20 months with incredible partners like Ocean Visions to advance the natural and technological solutions, the hybrid solutions as well. <laughs> For, uh, for dramatic carbon removal worldwide. In this effort, the government of Kenya has been one of our anchor, if not the most important anchor partners, and their leadership has not been incredible. We've talked about the UN General Assembly re resolution that's moving forward. As you can see, we have a comprehensive approach here, including leadership awards and knowledge base, very much the policy and governance frameworks that were just discussed uh, by our OCEANS panel, as well as creating the markets for both natural and technological solutions, as well as financing. Uh, we have the principles. We have a set of work on carbon removal pledges. We need to go beyond net zero to net negative and carbon removal now. Net zero is not enough for companies, governments, societies at large. We have an act active work with, again, our Global Futures Lab and partners around the world on really creating a unified approach to certificates of carbon sequestration and certifying buyers alliances so to ensure that we reduce the cost and increase the supply of solutions that are gonna remove, uh, remove carbon from the atmosphere. So if you think about all of this together, what we are launching is the Global uh, Carbon Removal Partnership with the Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Board. Of course, the government of Kenya. We hope the government of Colombia. We've, we've been working closely with them. Many others will join that, again, inclusive of natural and technological solutions, safe, durable, scalable, equitable, and sustainable, headquartered in, in Nairobi and Los Angeles. With that, I just want to pass it over first to Madam Ruto and then to Principal Secretary to share their incredible perspectives on this ambitious new effort that we couldn't have done without their leadership. Madam Ruto. Thank you so much, uh, Sanjeev and the Thunderbird School of Global Management, together with all the stakeholders and government of Kenya. Um, I work with uh, women, uh, about 100,000 women in our country and growing every day. Uh, these women are grassroots women and based in the rural areas and informal settlement. Uh, naturally, this tells us that these women are agri-based. They, they work in the agricultural sector. And uh, the talk on carbon removal has been on for several years. And uh, uh, we know that uh, women are, play a great part in, in carbon removal, especially in the things that they do in the agricultural sector, in the rural areas. Uh, I'm very glad uh, that one of the principles on carbon removal is inclusivity. We know that uh, many other times uh, that uh, women are excluded in this talk. And as we come here today, we want to request and ask that women can be included in this talk of carbon removal. We know that uh, there's going to be about uh, three to five trillion dollars that are going to uh, be paid out in, uh, along the time uh, in carbon removal. And so uh, I just want to offer our organization, uh, the MAMA organization and Joyful Women, even as we work with the women of Kenya, uh, with the partnership with Thunderbird, uh, that uh, these women can be included in this talk of uh, carbon removal. So we are determined and uh, we offer ourselves to be part of uh, the talk. 
Thank you. Madam Ruto, you are our champion. The women of Kenya and the women of the world are our champions. Over to you, Principal Secretary. Thank you very much, and uh, good to be here. Uh, negotiations are going on elsewhere, so I need to join them. But I just wanted to be here to register the presence of the Kenya government here. And uh, just to say that we are happy, we are going to be, Nairobi is going to be the host for the global partnership. As you know, Kenya is a leader on matters environment. We host the UNEP and our credentials also on areas of mitigation speak for themselves. If you look at our renewable sector, the energy sector, over 90% of our energy is green. It is, it is clean. And therefore, and we are, we are targeting to, do, to be 100% green by 2030. So we want to make sure, and we have already submitted our NDC for the next 20 year, uh, for 10 years, we are going to be implementing our climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation. It's going to be a lot of money, $62 billion, $18 billion for mitigation, 44 for adaptation. So if this can be part and part of helping that goal, that would really be great. Otherwise, I really don't want to say more than that because my team uh, from Kenya will, will say more than that. As, as, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Principal Secretary. If we could go to Ali for one final set of words before we go to Kumi and a man. Thank Alice. you very much, uh, Sanjeev. As I said earlier, uh, and the Principal Secretary said, Kenya is uh, a big player in matters of uh, environmental conservation. On carbon removal, I said earlier that um, we have a huge tracts of land at the national protected areas that uh, previously have just been known for safaris, but we're now working with the U.S. organizations, the U.S. Uh, aid and other private sector to convert this into huge carbon sinks and to pay for themselves. Uh, and we're working with them. Uh, hopefully, uh, we will be able to conclude the Article 6 negotiations here so that the markets can start now generating the resources that are required for adaptation and so on, uh, for adaptation and mitigation. And so we'll use our forests, our protected areas, to convert them into huge things and, and bring benefits to the local communities and to the country and to the globe. Thank, Thank you. you. So much. I'm going to pass it over to Brother Kumi for final words. Albert Einstein once said, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting to get different results. We need to be bold, innovative, inclusive, and courageous in actually exploring additionality to the current two pillars that we've had of mitigation and adaptation that sadly have not yet delivered anywhere close that we've wanted. But to do so in a way that wins global public support is critical. And so as this partnership evolves, we need to make sure that those that are suffering most as a result of current climate impacts their voices need to be heard in this process, that those that benefit directly from the different initiatives are those that currently suffer the most. And if we have that uh, principles in our mind and we explore uh, and implement each of those five principles in its, with absolute seriousness, earnestness, and commitment, I believe that carbon removal can give the possibility for Kiribati, for example, uh, known mostly as Kiribati. But Kiribati, for example, already has had to lease land from Fiji in preparation for the entire population to be re uh, relocated there. Sadly to say in conclusion that far too many powerful and rich countries in the world have basically taken a view for some time now that those people in small island states, least developing, uh, de uh, developed countries and all, are dispensable and it's fine if they just disappear. Carbon removal offers us a possibility for those communities to be able to give, be given a chance for survival. And for that reason alone, I would say, we have to give this the best possible shot we can. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kumi. On behalf of Ambassador Ellis from the ASU Global Futures Laboratory, on behalf of the Thunderbird School of Global Management, which I have the honor and privilege of leading as the Dean and Director General, our partners from Kenya, from Colombia, from around the world, this is the time for bold and ambitious action. 
anything you want to learn about in terms of the Parliament Removal Partnership, please check out our website. And you can certainly, of, of course, uh, contact us. This is the time, and we are ready to go. Carbon removal is a critical third pillar of global transformation around climate, but also more broadly for social justice, environmental justice, and economic uh, progress. Thank you all so very much. Join us. We can make a better future together. And as Ocean's icon Sylvia Earle reminds us, this decade is the most consequential in the next 10,000. This is our decade. Radical collaboration. R Thank you, Ambassador Ellis. Thank you so much. That's it? And the major focus on oceans, absolutely. That's why. Okay, please. Yeah, I just wanted to say on the oceans, uh, thanks to the bed and the team that was here. And yes, there's no discussion on the oceans here, but uh, as the negotiators will know, this cover decisions that are now currently being discussed, Kenya through the African group of negotiators have pushed to ensure that oceans will become a, an agenda in substa, subsequent substa's and we hope the other governments that are here will also support us. Uh, and that is something we are also pushing in this uh, COP now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ali. Thank you, everyone. We've been a little over time, but uh, feel the energy and let's go forward. <laughs>